I'd like to thank the museum for inviting me, but uh, most of all, I want to thank all of y'all for coming. Uh, now I just hope I don't suck. Um, <laughs> A couple of things. First of all, let me apologize. You're going to see I'm chewing gum and I'll be sipping liquid. I take some medicine to dry me out. It makes it hard for me to speak. It could make it even harder for you to understand what I'm saying if I don't do this. So I do apologize. You're not seeing me at my best today. But in all honesty, my wife's been waiting for 43 years to see me at my best and it hasn't happened for her either. Uh, also, if you have any questions, please just save them to the end. If you would, just write them on a $20 bill and hand them to me as you leave. And if you want an answer, uh, please use a $50 bill. Uh, I am a metal detectorist. Uh, like he said, I used to be an avid fisherman until I got into dirt fishing. Uh, Grace says, I come home every bit as dirty, but I smell a little better these days. So we'll see. There are two basic groups of metal detectorists. You have treasure hunters, history hunters. Now I'm a history hunter for two very important reasons. The first is I'm a history buff, which is amazing because in school I couldn't stand history. I think it was probably just because it was too impersonal for me. Uh, we studied large groups of people, dates I could never keep straight, and a lot of names that I could neither spell <laughs> nor pronounce. Um, but when you're metal detecting, you find bits and pieces of people's lives and it makes it a lot more personal uh, and it's easier to understand. As an example, recently I found a button that came off the overcoat for a Union soldier. Holding that in my hand, you know, I couldn't help but imagine what was the soldier like? Was he old? Was he young? Did he volunteer to fight or was he forced into it? And of course, did he survive and get to go home? Uh, and so because of that, it's kind of my personal objective to recover as much of the history as I can because I despair at the idea of so much of our past in the ground underneath our feet rusting and rotting away. And my objective is to find it, when possible restore it, and hopefully find a home for it in a school, a museum, or a library. Now the second reason that I'm not a treasure hunter is because frankly I've never found any treasure. <laughs> but if I ever do, there's a good chance I might be willing to switch teams. <laughs> but in the spirit of this, I'd like to start off with a little history lesson. And I'd like to tell you the story of the very first metal detector. It was made in 1881 by Alexander Graham Bell. Yep. Father of the telephone, great-great-grandfather of the Android and iPhone. He was a scientific genius. And he was well familiar with the basic laws of electromagnetism including the one that says that if you apply a power source to a coil of wires, you can produce a magnetic field. And that magnetic field, if it goes over metal, will produce an echo. And Bell realized if you simply trace that echo, it'll lead you back to the source, thus allowing you to detect metal. And so he made a small machine, but interestingly enough, he didn't make it for scientific purposes, nor for financial gain, but purely humanitarian reasons. Because in 1881, we had a new president, our 20th, but by the name of James Garfield. Now, Garfield is best remembered as being the second president to be assassinated and the president with the second shortest amount of time in office. Now, for those of you who like to keep score, the president with the shortest amount of time was our ninth, William Henry Harrison who also holds the record for the longest inauguration speech ever given. <laughs> True fact. It was an hour and a half long. It was delivered outside in freezing temperatures in the middle of a hard driving rain. Showing great leadership skills, he wore neither hat, gloves, nor overcoat. Now my mother always told me if I went outside dressed like that, I'm going to catch a cold. And that's what happened. He caught a cold, it turned into pneumonia, and 30 days after becoming president, he was dead. And this may sound a little harsh, but I'm pretty sure there were probably people who endured that speech in that horrific weather, who upon learning of his death, and particularly the reason for it, had to have been thinking, there really is a God. <laughs> now, Garfield, Garfield was shot by a man who believed that he was owed a job. 
The fellow's name was Charles Guiteau. He was a minister, he was a lawyer, and he was absolutely insane. Uh, he, applied, he thought he should be made the American Council to Vienna. And when he was refused, he got angry, and he took his problems to God. And he believed that God spoke to him. And God told him, to go kill Garfield. So, he got himself a very powerful handgun, a British uh, Bulldog 44 caliber pistol. And just less than four months after taking uh, office, Garfield was getting ready to go on vacation with his family, and Guiteau stepped up behind him at the rail station and shot him in the back. Now, two things are wrong about that. First of all, shooting the man. Second of all, shooting the man just before he goes on vacation. <laughs> you know, I've often thought, I wish somebody had shot me when I was coming off of vacation and going back to work, <laughs> but I think it's awfully cruel to shoot somebody beforehand. Well, Garfield didn't die. And so he was taken to the White House and he was put into his bed and he came under the care of a physician by the name of Dr. Dr. Bliss. Let me repeat that, Dr. Dr. Bliss. When he was born, his parents named him Dr. Willard Bliss. When he got his medical degree, he became, of course, Dr. Dr. Bliss. <laughs> Bliss was a former uh, Union Army surgeon. Claimed he had extensive battlefield gunshot wound experience. He believed that it was absolutely urgent to remove a bullet from a man's body. Otherwise, blood poisoning and other infections would set in and prove to be fatal. He also openly scoffed Joseph Lister's ideas on sanitation, germs, and particularly washing your hands. Bliss said that before performing surgery, not only was it not necessary to wash your hands, it was simply too much work. And also, it seems he didn't really have a whole lot in anesthesia either, because it seems he never gave the president any. Well, he began his treatment of Garfield by taking his unwashed fingers, jamming them into the wound, and digging around trying to find the bullet, which, of course, was unsuccessful. Because he knew the bullet lay on Garfield's right side, he then began to use metal probes. Well, he not only did not find the bullet, he did manage to find Garfield's liver and lacerated it. So, based upon this, he then informs the president, the family, and the press that Garfield will be dead by morning. There's no record of how this message was conveyed. I've often thought it'd be something like, good night, Mr. President, sleep tight, sweet dreams, and don't bother setting your alarm clock. Uh, but nonetheless, in the morning, Garfield was not only still alive, he was actually showing signs of improvement. Well, this only bolstered Bliss to continue his effort to find the bullet. So to give himself more room to work with, he cuts a three inch incision into Garfield's body. In time, that became a 20 inch incision going around his side and down into his groin and he still can't find the bullet. It was at this point that Bell, having heard of the president's plight, made his machine went to the White House and offered to help. Now, Bliss was a bona fide prima donna, and he hated the idea of sharing the glory of saving the president's life with anybody, but he's kind of at a dead end here. So he begrudgingly allows him, provided that Bell only searches Garfield's right side, because that's where the bullet is. Well, Bell begins to use his machine, and something horrifying happens. Instead of getting a single signal indicating the location of the bullet, he got multiple signals. It was as if Garfield's body was riddled with bullets. Embarrassed and confused, he left, went back to his lab, tested his machine, seemed to be working fine. He went back to the White House, but he got the same results. So he left again. This time he found some Confederate soldiers who still had bullets in their bodies which tells me that I'm on the same health plan as they were. Um, and the machine seemed to be working fine. So he went back to the White House. But now Bliss refuses him access. Not only that, Bliss goes to the press and tells them that Bell is a charlatan and a fraud and his machine doesn't work. Bell is in disgrace. It wasn't until much later he learns that Bliss 
refused his request to put Garfield in a different bed because Garfield had a new type of bed, one that had metal springs in it. And that's what the machine was picking up. Garfield lingered for 81 days, died in horrible agony. An autopsy was done. They found the bullet. It was about a foot away from where Bliss had said it would be on Garfield's left side. At his trial, Gateau made the claim, I did not kill Garfield. I shot him, but his doctors killed him. Now that did not prevent him from going to the gallows, where by the way, he danced up the steps, he waved to the spectators, shook the hangman's hand, and for his final words, he recited a poem he had written called, Go Into the Lordy. However, his request to have an orchestra accompany him was denied. <laughs> this is all true, folks. Well, like I said, he made the claim that the doctors killed him. Over the years, a number of medical experts have reviewed the notes and the records, and their conclusion has been, had Garfield been left untreated, he probably would have survived. So indeed, his medical care did him in. Bliss was brought up on charges of malpractice, but he had friends in high places, nothing ever happened. However, one of the doctors who testified against him made a statement that is still part of our vernacular today when he simply said that ignorance is bliss. <laughs> well, Garfield died, but the metal detector survived. And of course, has evolved into a number of helpful tools for the military, homeland security, underwater exploration, and fools like me. Uh, I'm often asked, what is the attraction to metal detecting? And that's a valid question. Because I know sometimes we look pretty silly out there waving sticks with dinner plates on the end of them. In fact, uh, one young fellow told me one time that he told his girlfriend he wanted to get a metal detector, and she told him, don't be silly, that's for old fat men. Oh. <laughs> and I kind of laughed until I looked in the mirror. She uh, might have a point. Well, speaking for myself, as I'm going into my second childhood, I remember fondly my first. And the two best days of the year were always Easter and Christmas morning. Now, Easter morning, you have your hunt for the eggs. What a thrill that was. And of course, how much fun you find them. Christmas morning, you get to unwrap presents to find out what's in there in the hopes that you've been good. And I'm sure all of us hope to find a pony. <laughs> Well, every time I go out hunting, I feel exactly like that. I have the thrill of Easter morning, but I have to look and I have to find. And then just like on Christmas morning, and I have to carefully uncover what I have found. And then and only then do I learn that the overwhelming majority of it is going to be coal and underwear. <laughs> because unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of trash in the ground. And I don't care how pretty you think your yard is and how clean it is, I guarantee you there's some nasty stuff under your feet. Uh, let me put a little side note here too. Uh, any good metal detectorist follows a code of ethics that's been in place for about 50 years. They were written by Charles uh, Garrett, one of the pioneers in metal detecting. And the gist of it is we try to leave a property in better shape than we find it. And what I mean by that is we don't bury that trash back or leave it on the ground, or leave holes out, damaged plants, landscaping, any of that. Uh, I've invested a lot of money in my equipment. I have nine different metal detectors. Uh, but I've got some really, really good digging tools so that uh, very rarely can even tell where I've been. Also, personally, I pick up the litter, and on more than one occasion, I've buried dead animals for people. Uh, but anyway, if you continue, in spite of the coal and the underwear, if you stick with it, eventually you're going to find a pony. Now, come on. Oh, there we go. Now, ponies can come in a lot of different forms and fashions. It might be a nice piece of jewelry. I found that on Fernandina Beach last year, right before Mother's Day. It has over 30 diamonds on it. It was a nice Mother's Day gift for my wife, and I didn't have to spend any money. <laughs> um, 
And I don't know how she manages to do it, but every really nice ring I've ever found fits her perfectly. <laughs> it might be in the form of an old or unusual or even sometimes rare coin. Now this is the oldest coin I've ever found. It's a 1775 Spanish real. It was minted in Mexico City. Reals came in denominations of one, two, four, and eight. This was a one. Uh, I love finding coins. Now I'll tell you, they've been in the ground, they have very little real value. Your, your collectors that pay big bucks for coins, they're not interested in anything that's been buried. They want mint or uncirculated conditions. But to me, coins are pieces of artwork. They were beautiful, and of course, when you can find a date on it, it will give you an idea of the other things that you find, what kind of date they might have. Uh, the second oldest coin I've ever found was a 1785 uh, Georgius Triumphal, which some people consider to be the first true American coin. Uh, 1783 is when we signed the treaty with England, and the coin was minted to honor George Washington for winning the Revolutionary War. The name means George triumphed. But it was minted in England, and they claimed they didn't know what Washington looked like, and they used the bust of George III, who lost the war. Which might be, a, you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, up yours uh, for, uh, for us. Uh, and it might be a really nice relic. Now, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a Victorian lady's coin purse. <clears throat> It is sterling silver, it was dipped in gold. The uh, little Scotty dog on the, the lid, the lid pops up, and that neck accordions out, and they were able to put coins in it. They rarely used them for coins though, because back then ladies didn't handle currency, their husbands did. What they would normally do, you can see that little loop right there, they'd run a chain through that, and they would stuff it with rose petals or pieces of perfumed cloth and wear it around their necks. You know, they didn't bathe a whole lot back then. So basically, they turn themselves into little potpourris. <laughs> One of the interesting things about it is that and the coin I was just telling you about, the 1783, I found on the west side of Jacksonville in the Ortega area at the home site of Daniel McGurk's. Now, if you're familiar with the Ortega area, you know that there's McGurk's Creek and McGurk's Boulevard named in his honor because he was, I believe, the original settler in that area. But more people knew the truth about him, they wouldn't have named anything after him. Because in reality, Daniel McGurk's was an officer in the Revolutionary Army, but he became a turncoat and went over to the British. Well, after they lost the war, he couldn't go home. He came down here, started a plantation, and became a pirate. So uh, we found some really interesting relics in his place. Gold teeth. <laughs> now, I don't think they're going to fit me, but if anybody here wants to try them on, and they will fit you, we can talk. <laughs> but the reality is, this is not why I was brought here today to talk to y'all. I was asked to tell you about something I recently found that has actually gotten me a little bit of notoriety. I've uh, gotten several uh, awards from major uh, companies in the metal detecting uh, industry. Uh, it's a couple newspaper articles, and there have been three full-page magazine articles published, uh, one in the United States, one in the UK, and one in Scotland. The item that I'm talking about is not a pony, it's not a horse, it's actually a Pegasus. Because unless I find Jimmy Hoffa or the Holy Grail, this is going to be my find of a lifetime. And the thing about it is, I nearly threw it away. I was invited to hunt a private property, person's yard, and during the course of the day, I had found several small cans buried in the dirt. And I found what I believed was the lid to one of those cans. Couldn't tell because it was absolutely encrusted in about a quarter inch thick layer of hard as a rock, dried on black mud. But I could see a little bit of the rim. And the can lid, I put it in my trash pouch uh, with intentions of recycling it. When I get home, I take all my trash, and once a year I take a full trailer load of scrap metal that I have found metal detecting to the recycling center. So I have a series of barrels, and I take all the trash, and I sort it, 
So all the steel and iron goes into one barrel, the aluminum into another, and so forth. But I examine everything, just give it a second look to make sure I have it. You know, actually missed something. And when I got to this, I still thought it was a can lid. But the pressure of my thumb broke a little bit of the dirt off. And I could see there was a little loop coming out of it. And I remember thinking, can lids don't have these. Maybe I need to check this out. Now, by the way, that is called a bail, B-A-I-L. The purpose of a bail is so you can run a string, a ribbon, or a chain through that, and wear it as whatever the item is, as a decoration or a piece of jewelry. So, I took it into my workshop. I got a soft bristle toothbrush, and I began to scrub away at the dirt. When I got down to bare metal, I saw two things that really surprised me. The first was that the metal appeared to be tarnished. Now, can lids will rust. They don't tarnish. Silver will tarnish. But also, I could see that there were engravings on it. Now, most of it was still covered with dirt. This little bit was breaking through here. And I see a three-word phrase that I happen to be very familiar with. It's Gaelic, and it says, I mock sicker. And I know there are two groups of people most likely to recognize that phrase and understand the significance of it. The first would be Scottish historians. Because anybody who has studied Scottish history <clears throat> would most definitely know the circumstances around where this phrase came from and probably recognize the phrase itself. And they would know that in 1306, those three words put a king on the throne of Scotland. The second group of people who would be most definitely aware of this phrase would be members of the Kirkpatrick family. Yeah, I'm talking my gang, my posse, my family. Because it was a Kirkpatrick who said those three words. And there's a heck of a story behind this, which I will tell you in a little bit. Now, I don't blame if anybody here is skeptical about this, because I was kind of like, wow, I, don't know, I can't believe I found this. But this is the Kirkpatrick family crest. Three things to remember on this. The first, at the top, the hand holding the bloody dagger. You're going to hear about that. Also on the shield, those are three pillows does not mean that the Kirkpatricks are world-class nap takers, uh, although I might qualify. But then, of course, here you see that phrase. That, that is the family logo, or motto, I should say, I'm Max Sicker. Needless to say, I did not throw this thing away. I continued to clean it, and when I did, this is what I have. Now, I'm going to pass this around, let you look at it, with the understanding that if it doesn't come back, we will be conducting full body cavity surgery. <laughs> and understand, it may not look like it, but I can run a heck of a lot faster than you might think. Don't make me chase you down. Now, this is both sides of it. It looks concave in here because of this crease, but it's flat. It's two inches across, it's silver, and it is engraved, as you see, on both sides. Now, looking at it, I was pretty sure that this thing has Scottish origin. By the way, how many people in here have Scottish blood in them? All the good-looking ones. Okay, cool. Uh, well, a couple of things right off the bat. The, uh, the lion. Now, let me say, whoever did this, A, had excellent penmanship. My second grade teacher would have loved him. And more than a little bit of artistic skill. But I have to admit, that's the goofiest looking lion I have ever seen. Uh, and over here is a thistle. Thistle is a national flower of Scotland. The story behind that is centuries ago, a Viking army invaded, uh, invaded Scotland in the middle of the night. They were sneaking up on the Scottish army as it slept. They had removed their footwear in order to walk a little bit quieter. And one of them stepped on a thistle. And they have really nasty spines on them. And he screamed out, oh my gosh, or some other equivalent, woke the Scots up and prevented themselves from being slaughtered. 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think on the left is Heather. But, uh, but anyway, I did recognize these. And on the other side is the phrase, none shall provoke me with impunity. That is the Scottish national motto, as well as the motto of the Order of the Thistle. And that's all I know. But my curiosity is up, and I want to know as much about it as I can. So I take a bunch of pictures, and then for the next, oh, seven or eight weeks, I spent every spare moment I had researching researchers, trying to find people I could send the pictures to that might be able to share some information about what's on this disk. And this will give you an idea. Uh, major museums, uh, every Scottish university with a history department, I sent it to the department, to the head of the department, and every historian I could find, a uh, number of local schools, uh, any kind of museum that had any kind of Scottish uh, touch to it. Uh, most informative was the Tartan Museum in Franklin, North Carolina. They were very helpful. Uh, countless historians, I watched documentaries, I read articles, I read books, getting names and then trying to find emails and so forth, uh, Scottish websites and forums. My wife one time was watching uh, Antique Roadshow on PBS, and I walked through and there's a guy with a collection of 18th century or 1800s uh, silver Scottish jewelry. And I got the name of the guy who was appraising it and sent the pictures to him. And he was also very informative. Well, bit by bit, I start getting answers. Um, unfortunately, nobody said, okay, this is what all of this stuff is, which would have made my life a lot simpler. Uh, nor did anybody ever really give me complete answers. So this has been like putting together a huge jigsaw puzzle. And there are things, so I'm going to tell you what we know that we know, what we think we know, and what we know we don't know about this. Uh, first of all, there were a couple of things that I looked at and looked at and looked at and couldn't figure out what in the dickens is it. And that rectangle on top is one of them. And it wasn't until somebody said, hourglass. And I went, ah, that's what it is. Now, the hourglass is most commonly used on tombstones to uh, basically represent the passing of time. There are a number of other translations for it. Uh, the passing of seasons, life goes on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't really have an explanation as to why it is on this disc, other than the fact that the events that are represented on this span 400 years. So maybe that was the purpose for putting it. The heart with the arrow through it. It's not Valentine's Day. It's not, uh, you know, lost love, whatever. Anytime you see a heart that is pierced with an arrow, thorns, whatever, that was one of the secret symbols for the Jacobites. Now, if you're not familiar with the Jacobites, um, in the 1600s, England and Scotland were ruled by the Stuarts. In 1686, I believe it was, James II, he was James II in England, James VII in Scotland, don't ask me why, he was deposed. An awful lot of loyal followers. And the name Jacobite, James in Latin is Jacobus, so Jacobus, Jacobite. For the next 60 years, there were five different revolts, revolutions, assassination attempts, etc., etc., in an attempt to put the Stuarts back on the throne. They were a real pain in the butt for the English. In 1746, Charles Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie on one side, the great deceiver on the other, came back from France, raised an army primarily of Highlanders, and tried to put them back on again. They were absolutely devastated at the Battle of Culloden. Charles escaped and went back to France, but the English and the Campbells, who were their primary allies in this, then persecuted the dickens out of the <coughs> remaining Jacobites. If you were a Jacobite, or if they even suspected you were a Jacobite, you were either executed or imprisoned. 
And they had an interesting method there in that if you were a nobleman, you were beheaded. If you were a commoner, you were hung. And they didn't care if you were man, woman, or child. They burned, I mean, it was devastating what they did. So they went underground. So this is like the early Christians using the fish to identify them. Again, one of my ancestors drew the short straw and was sent to join the Jacobites. He was caught, he was beheaded, and his lands uh, taken. Now this symbol is a lot of fun. When I first looked at it, I thought, cool, somebody holding a metal detector. <laughs> but, of course, it's not. And this was the other thing that I kept looking at going, what in the dickens can that be? That's supposed to be a rose. And a rose was a symbol for England. Uh, I've gotten three different interpretations of this. The, uh, the first is that it is a unicorn with a lance. And by the way, on all of these, you see that the, the long instrument is stabbing or piercing the rose. The inflection here is attacking England. So somebody said, well, it's a unicorn with a lance. Well, that not like any unicorn I've ever seen. Maybe they grow them different in Scotland. But the unicorn was a symbol for uh, Scotland. The second one was that it is a horse with a crown on it, indicating that a nobleman defeated an Englishman in a joust. I don't really like either one of those. But more people said, no, it is a hand holding a sword, stabbing the rose, thus striking at England. Uh, a couple of interesting points were made. Several people said this obviously was owned by a nobleman because the hand, if indeed it is a hand, is protected by a glove of chain mail. And only the nobility had the funds for that back then. Another one said, obviously belonged to a nobleman because the silver content of this would have been worth about eight months worth of wages for a common farm worker. But several people also said, it looks like the hand has six fingers. And if you ever saw the movie, <laughs> The Prince's Bride, which is one of my favorites, then you know one of the main characters here is searching for the six-fingered man who killed his father. Uh, sorry, it has nothing to do with the presentation. I just couldn't help but throw it in. <laughs> All right, now we're going to get to the really good stuff. Show of hands, how many people in here did not see the movie Braveheart? Okay, we're going to wait while y'all go watch it. <laughs> All right. Braveheart, about William Wallace, Scotland's greatest hero. 1995 got five Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Considered one of the three most historically inaccurate movies of all time. <laughs> they went nuts with the script. Uh, some of the highlights of the things that uh, they misrepresented or twisted. Uh, the Battle of, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember now the name. Uh, <coughs> Sterling? Thank you. Battle of Stirling, where they won their great victory, was actually the Battle of Stirling Bridge. There was no bridge in that battle city, and the bridge played a major part in the Scottish uh, ability to defeat the, uh, the British. Uh, Mel Gibson and his gang wearing the blue face paint into battle. You know, nobody else on the Scottish team was wearing it. That's because they were all laughing, because they knew that no Scot ever wore blue face paint. <laughs> Those were picks. 500 years before. Mel Gibson looked great in a kilt. Too bad kilts never made it to uh, Scottish uh, fashions until 200 years later. They wore trousers. And the best was, of course, Princess Isabella meeting Wallace, falling in love, getting pregnant. She was nine years old at the time and still in England. Or still in French. <laughs> but nonetheless, William Wallace absolutely one of the greatest heroes of all time uh, in Scotland. Here we have a date, August 23rd, 1299, and beneath that the initials WW. Now like I said, I have sent this to a lot of historians. Everybody has said, it's Wallace. It's got to be. The mystery is the date. If you Google August 23rd, 1299, 
nothing comes up. That must have been a global do-nothing day. Uh, so what is the significance of it? There are two possibilities, and I'll let you pick the one you like. It is known that Wallace left Scotland and went to France for several years. He went to the court of King Philippe to seek his help in fighting the English. And originally, Philippe and Edward, Edward I, uh, were at odds, and he promised to help the Scots. And by the time he got around to actually doing something, he and Edward had kissed and met. But nobody thinks he went on the 23rd. Now, August 23rd, 1305, was the date of Wallace's execution in London. And what an execution it was. First, they dragged him naked through the streets for six miles behind a horse, subjecting him to every kind of humiliation and injury possible. Then they hung him, not long enough to kill him, but long enough to torture him. Then they emasculated him and burned his genitals in front of his eyes. They disemboweled him, again, burnt the end of his uh, intestines. Then they ripped his heart out while it was still beating. They quartered him, and for good measure, they cut off his head. They wanted him dead. Uh, like I said, because this was probably made 400 years later, possibly they got the year wrong. But you get to pick. Now, I, Mike Sicker, I told you this. This is a story. In Braveheart, we met Robert the Bruce, who is shown as kind of a kind of a nice guy, kind of wishy-washy. Yeah, maybe I want to be king, maybe I don't. You know, blah blah blah. In reality, he was a manipulative sob. He desperately wanted to become king. But he had a very powerful opponent by the name of John Common, C-O-M-Y-N. There were two John Commons, father and son. Father went by Black Common, Junior was Red Common, and Red was his opponent. Uh, they hated each other. Edward had actually named the two of them co-guardians of Scotland, which meant they were responsible for running the country, and it didn't work very well. One of them needed to be made king. Bruce was actually planning a revolt and Common squealed him out to Edward and Bruce had to leave England uh, to avoid being captured and executed. But Bruce knew that he was about to be first runner-up in the race to become king because most of the nobles preferred Common as did Edward. So he hit upon a plan. He proposed that the two men have a meeting, just the two of them, to negotiate terms. And what he wanted to propose was, if he became king, he would sign all of the Bruce lands over to the commons. Or common could take the throne, and the Bruces would receive their land. So one would become very powerful, one would become very wealthy. He then proposed that the two men meet in the Greyfriars Church in Dumfries, at the altar. They would go in alone and unarmed, which was brilliant, because the church was considered sanctuary. You were safe. Nothing could happen to you there. Common agreed. They met outside the church. They were, their weapons were taken from them. They went inside. Nobody knows exactly what happened. But somehow Bruce, who was supposed to be unarmed, pulls a dagger and stabs Common. And then ran. I keep thinking, your opponent's unarmed and laying on the floor bleeding, and you run? What kind of a king are you going to be? But nonetheless, he did. He ran outside, and who does he run into but his best friend and cousin, Sir Roger Kirkpatrick. Again, one of my gang. Kirkpatrick sees the blood on Bruce and asks what's going on. Bruce explains. Kirkpatrick asks, is Common dead? And Bruce goes, I don't think so. Kirkpatrick pulls his dagger, remember that hand with the bloody dagger? Says, I max sicker, which means I make sure. He went back into the church and finished the job of butchering Common. The two men are now outlaws, and they're chased by the Common family, and they had to flee. They spent three nights sleeping in the woods. That's where the three pillows on the family crest came from. After, and Bruce was crowned king eight days later. Uh, so it was a good ploy. Uh, after he became king, he decreed, I, Mike Sicker, would now be the Kirkpatrick family motto. So imagine what a shock it was to see it on this thing. But even more so was this. 
We thought this was a name. It looks like it says Tuchin or Tuchin. Middle initial either I or J, Pierce. And we Googled every variation of it we could, couldn't find anything on it. So somebody said, it's not a name, it's a phrase. It's touch and I pierce, which I did not know this, but it was interesting to find out. That was the Kirkpatrick motto before the common issue. So there's two different references on this thing to my ancestors. Uh, so, the question is, of course, how did it get here? Well, in the late 1600s, like I said, many Jacobites, fearing for their lives, fled Scotland, came here. In 1740, James Oglethorpe was named the governor of Georgia. By the way, he's the one who named Amelia Island, Amelia Island. Uh, he was tasked with preventing the Spanish in St. Augustine from advancing into South Carolina, and he needed a really fierce a band of fighters, so he recruited a bunch of Highlanders. And they formed the town of Darien, 70 miles up the road. Uh, also, now, the Kirkpatricks were not Highlanders, they were Lowlanders. But, who knows, maybe they let us in. Uh, but also, though, the prisons were emptied, and the, prisons, the prisoners were sent here as well. So again, many of the Jacobites were imprisoned. My theory is that this disc is some sort of a family uh, keepsake, memory, history book, whatever you want to call it. And that's what it was. It was sent over here with somebody. Where did you find it? I can't tell you. Okay. Uh, I was sworn to secrecy by the property owner, but I never disclosed that anyway. No, I, I but, but very, very close. Uh, now, the interesting thing, too, was this crease. Was it possibly caused in combat? Was it struck with a sword, a spear, uh, whatever? And that could be how the thing became lost. But anyway, that's my story. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Before I close, I will say, this is my life. I enjoy doing this. If you have some property that you might be willing to uh, or interested in having searched, my cards are up here. I do it for free. If you've lost something, I do it for free. Uh, I do it all for free. Uh, please feel free to uh, to call me. Now, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Just what the things you have on the table are these things you found on the island, or are they from all over? Uh, a couple of things were found in Jacksonville, but primarily, yes, here in the island. Yes, when you find something like that, that is, does that become yours, or is it the property? Oh, owner? great question. Here's the agreement I normally have. Uh, if I find something really valuable, we split it. I ask for coins, not because I'm likely to find anything that's worth anything, but they help pay for my cost. Uh, other than that, the property owner can have anything I find. If they don't want it, and oftentimes they don't, then I take it. If it's trash, like I said, I recycle it. Uh, if it's something worth holding on to, I'll try and you know add it to some collection or something like that. Yes. How deep in the soil are these things? I <coughs> probably various depths, but uh, well, that disc was barely under the ground at all. Really? Right? really? Um, some of these things, three, four inches. Uh, a detector will not go that deep. Uh, you know, like I said, that's why it's so easy oftentimes to recover something and not leave any trace. You just simply basically slide your digger up underneath. I have a, a probe, actually I have several of them, they're like little mini detectors. You slide it in there, locates the actual object, reach in, pull it out, tamp the grass back down, and yes, sir. Have you done the old town up here at all to any extent? Uh, I've gotten a couple permissions in there. I've also had some people chew me out for being in there, even though I was on permissions. Well, it's a public park, the plaza, around there. Uh, no, I have not done that, but I'm sure everybody in the world has. But uh, I didn't realize it was a public park. I thought it was a state park. Well, it's no, state state park. Detecting okay, state parks, state parks, and national parks are verboten. Yeah. They uh, they get real nasty about that. Um, because the Scottish Highlanders were there for six years. Ah. 
But uh, I'll go anywhere that anybody will let me go. Uh, but no, I have not been to that. Yes, ma'am. I was curious as to your battery power that you find on us that you have nine metal detectors, that some of the nine volts or some of the higher power batteries will give you your depth on the metal detector. Do you have any recommendations of ballpark for metal detectors? Well, every machine that I use either has rechargeable batteries or uses uh, AA. And it's not so much the battery as it is the coil, uh, the size, and the uh, configuration of the coil. The coil being your plate. The flat part, yeah. Uh, because of a health issue, I use the smallest coil I can because it's less weight, which allows me to to do this. Uh, but yeah, I don't, know if I'm, I don't know if I'm answering your question no, or I, not. But I, I Yes, ma'am. Uh, digging on, uh, up here on Second Street, are you allowed to go over that land where they're putting the townhouses? Second and Ash, they've taken that whole block. Where the lumber yard was? Yes. Uh, are you allowed to go up and. I don't know, but I do know that the guys at the Maritime Museum, and by the way, if you're interested in treasure, <laughs> go to the Maritime Museum. That's right. But they, they, Billy and them went over it. Did they? And I'm sure they didn't leave anything. Yeah, we're friends, and uh, they had a, like a treasure hunters expo uh, a month or so ago, and I was asked to participate in that. And in fact, I'm going there after we leave here because I need to ask him a question. And several of my items that I have found are on exhibit there. Wonderful. Okay. So, and, and your logo on your medallion again, the, the lion on a Scottish. Uh, medallion. Kind of curious because the lion is the English and the unicorn is the Scottish. So maybe there was a Lowlander. Uh, no, actually, uh, the the lion rampant is what they call it. Is uh, the Scottish emblem. Well, the lion and the unicorn are fighting for the crown. That's the English and the Scottish. Yeah, I don't know, but I mean, it's a. Uh, it's also you're right. It is an English symbol, but it's also a Scottish one. And the heart piercing. I noticed that the left extension of the arrow through the heart. It's pointing right at the jackpot to the hand. I mean, it's really extended, like that's who it is right there. Ah, interesting point. I mean, it's definitely longer than any other. Most, mostly, they're balanced on the hearts that you see. Some, some, some history. Sometimes. Interesting point. Is there another question over here? It was right here. Yes, sir. How deep could you say locate a knife? Depends upon how big the knife is. Uh, what kind of soil? What soil I can go deeper? I mean, I'm assuming you lost one. Yeah. Give me a call. Who else? Yes, sir. Where do you do most of your research? Then once you get a contact for a property, where do you? Do oh man, what a great question. Um, most of my research is done after I found something. And I'm on several uh, forums, metal detecting forums, and we have some people in there that are brilliant. Uh, that 1783 coin, I actually thought it was a slug because there was very little detail being shown. But I posted a picture of it, and in 15 minutes, somebody said, oh, that's exactly what this is. And I'm going, yeah, uh-huh. I'm holding it in my hand. I can't make out the detail, but you can tell what it is from that picture. He was absolutely right on. Uh, but that, the internet, I use all, I mean, whatever method I can. Well, hey, again, I thank you all for coming and putting up with me. And thank you. Thank you.